So good afternoon, everyone. I realize it's kind of a sleepy time, so it's going to be really, really interactive. We'll have, <laughs> um, and I used to teach, so I am not uh, averse to like pointing out and asking someone to ask a question. Um, we'll have about half the time we'll chat and I'll ask questions, and then about half the time I think we, we'll just open it up. But if anyone um, wants to jump in in the middle, that's fine too. Um, I am really thrilled that I was asked to moderate the session because I have struggled a lot with covering the Common Core. Um, it's either like really, you know, policy heavy and wonkish and all my, you know, editors want us to be in the classroom getting sound from kids with every story and I'm not sure how to do that with the common core often. Um, or I feel like I've, I'm just getting caught up in the for and against the common core. And so um, Corey Turner with NPR and Sarah Garland from the Heckinger Report um, are going to talk to us. So I'm gonna, we're going to pick their brains today. Um, Corey, we had a kind of uh, conversation earlier and Corey said, the common core is one of the most fun things to talk about. <laughs> and we were on this call and I, there was just silence from me. <laughs> And Sarah said, when I asked her about the Common Core, she said, you know, Common Core stories do really well, well online. It's not like broccoli you have to shove down someone's throat. <laughs> so this is like so different from my experience. I'm really <laughs> excited to hear this conversation. So I'm going to start by asking both of you, um, Sarah and Corey, if you could talk about a recent example um, where you've covered the Common Core and, and a little bit about it. I'm um, sure. I'll, do you want me to go first? Um, so I'll just quickly explain what the Heckinger Report is. From I think most of you probably know, and I've worked with a lot of you, but just quickly, we're a nonprofit news organization, and our model is to um, we cover education. Um, we partner with other publications on a lot of our stories. So um, we're very focused on doing education coverage that um, local newspapers or local radio stations or mainstream sites like The Atlantic or Slate are actually going to want to run and their readers are going to read it. So we're always thinking about how do we make this stuff accessible and interesting for just general readers. Um, and we've been doing a lot of Common Core coverage over the past couple of years. We're grant funded, so we've gotten a couple of grants um, to cover Common Core. And when I first started, when we first got this grant um, to work with EWA, I was just really kind of bummed. This is going to be so boring. And um, and since then, I've really gotten into it, like Corey. Like, it's um, a lot of fun, actually. Um, so we've done several things and just... When we started, I'll just start with that. One of the things that we really started on, it was pretty early on. The controversy wasn't as heated. This was back in 2012, 2013, um, when those polls were showing that no one had ever heard of Common Core. Um, so we sent reporters into classrooms to just kind of look at what was going on um, and spend time with teachers um, and in schools. A lot of our stories early on focused on the English because the big question was, you know, are, is everyone going to, you know, stop reading Huckleberry Finn and have to read, like, science textbooks? Um, so we did a lot of that, and we got some really good stories out of it. And I'm, let me just open up. I have a little cheat sheet of all the stories that I like the best on here. Um, but um, a couple of the stories that I think I really – that were some of our best out of those projects um, were a story where we sent a reporter in – um, to look at that question of are we still going to be doing creative writing or are all kids going to be just writing persuasive essays and so on and it was a radio it was a radio story um, so you know she was able to go into classrooms and just ask ask teachers that question like what are you doing now what are you doing differently and that was what I asked reporters to do is like so just ask people well, what are you doing differently are you doing anything um, differently and she got some great stuff just on you know the year before, the teacher had had this week-long assignment where kids wrote about um, the prompt was, just as my mom opened the oven for Thanksgiving, the turkey popped out and, and they spent a week like writing about working on an assignment on this writing prompt. And um, they still did that um, the following year, but I think they spent maybe a day on it and spent a lot more time doing sort of um, nonfiction kind of stuff. So I think just getting getting into teachers and you can get really evocative stuff like that. Like, what was your assignment last year and how did you change it? Um, I think you can make that's you know can make things a little bit more fun. 
Um, but I'll I'll stop talking. I can give more examples later. Cool. Um, <clears throat> it is true. I'm a Common Core nerd. Um, so if I talk too much, just start raising your hands, and I will be quiet. Um, at NPR Ed, it's a little different. So I don't know how many of you are local versus national. Since we're national, um, I, I, I think I can't remember what I was talking to this morning, but I said basically my audience is people who hear me in the shower uh, or in the car, and they have no vested interest. So my challenge um, is a little different from some folks who may be working locally or with specialized outlets. I have to I have to talk to people in a really basic way. Um, but that's a lot of fun when it comes to the core because it 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 allows me to throw out a lot of the weed the weeds the detours. Um, I mean, we all know that it's a really complicated thing, but part of the joy is is really trying to simplify it and to make sense of it. Um, at NPR Ed, um, and me in particular, I, I really try to approach things uh, from from the standpoint of what learning is happening. Um, is there learning in this story? And if there's no learning in the story, uh, quite often on the team, we'll just say, well, this isn't a story for us then. Um, even if it is Common Core, if it is if it is exclusively a politics story, we probably won't do it. Um, so if you look at, if I look back at um, some of the core stories that I've most enjoyed, that's my standard. Um, because if, I mean, this may, this may sound heretical, but if we bore people with our coverage, they won't pay attention and it won't matter. Um, so I, I try, I try to sneak the broccoli into my stories, um, so that people don't realize until a couple days later that there was actually something meaningful in there. Um, so I took the park test, uh, three or four months ago. Um, it, it was, it was fun because I, we, I edited a story from, uh, a reporter I like very much in, uh, Vermont. Uh, she had sat in on a close reading in an eighth grade English class. Um, and then coming out of that, I decided, well, I'm going to take the park test for eighth graders just to get a sense of what these kids are in for. And I just, I took it in one of our studios and I just recorded myself for hours taking this test and it was embarrassing. Um, but it seemed to click with people. Um, people talked to me a lot about that story, even though it, it seemed really simple and silly at the time. Um, I think uh, over the summer I did a couple of pieces on implementation because I feel like one of the great mistakes that people, that's people, not just journalists, but journalists certainly do this too, one of the great mistakes we make in talking about the core um, is we conflate all of these other issues that I think Mike McShane, McShane said this morning, they're related to the core, but you can't really talk substantially about the core without separating them out. You have to compartmentalize this stuff. Um, and, and for me, one of the stories I just kept hearing state by state by state was um, from teachers, certainly, the standards aren't the problem. It's the implementation. I've got no support from my curriculum director. I've got no professional development. I'm using workbooks that are seven years old. How is that possible if we've been on core for three years now? Um, so I went to Michigan and talked to Bill Schmidt, who was here earlier, uh, which was a lot of fun. And just exploring, asking teachers, okay, what are you using? You know, because again, people think the Common Core is everything. They think it's this massive tent that includes textbooks and lesson plans and everything in between, and it doesn't. Uh, and that's been the challenge for a lot of teachers, whatever they think of the standards. They have nothing to use to teach the standards unless they made it themselves. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is is this uh, series of stories we just finished uh, maybe a month ago that I had a big assist from Emily Hanford. Um, uh, a, there was a story on in the back of my brain that I'd wanted to do for a long time, which was, you know, I feel like there are two two families of arguments against the core. There are the arguments that are entirely political and cyclical. I mean, you could you could argue either way, you know. To the end of days, and and you couldn't prove either side right or wrong. And then there are the substantial child development arguments. And I really wanted to unpack this idea of a are they harder, and b in terms of development, what does it mean when we make kids struggle? Like, is that an inherently bad thing? So I focused exclusively on literacy and tried to figure out is is struggle a bad thing? Um, that was a lot of fun and and helpful. And I think. 
it, it was also a good way of getting at the core in a way that resonated with people who don't have kids or don't have kids who are students. I mean, again, I, I, I say this all the time at NPR Ed and, and my editor, Steve Drummond, who was here and will be here again, uh, reminds me of it too. We have to talk about this stuff so that it resonates with people who don't have a vested interest. And I think everyone is interested in stories about learning, about how our brains work, mm -hmm. about how we pick stuff up and hold on to it or forget it. Um, for me, that's what resonates and that's what makes the core engaging. Um, can you give us examples of stories about the core that you've really struggled with and how you went about covering them? Oh, you go first, Corey. <laughs> yeah, so this is a no. This is a great example. Um, <clears throat> I I constantly, if I have any advice for the room, uh, it's it's make sure you don't um, you don't kill people with nuance. Make sure you're right journalistically, but don't feel like you have an obligation as a journalist to include every detail. Okay, because the more detailed you get, the more likely you are to lose people. Part of your job as a journalist is to tell the story and, and assume you have the trust of your readers or your listeners and don't bury them with extra detail. Give them, make sure it's a, a compelling story. Um, so anytime I do a story, I'm constantly running into this wall. Wow, is this, do I have to get this in here? How important is this? Does this rate? And in the, the third story in the series I did with Emily on it was called The Struggle Over Struggle. I, I ran into this really interesting hiccup um, where all the child development people I was talking to, they all said that the core's obsession with text complexity is not inherently a bad thing. It can actually be a really good thing. But they also all said one thing that I didn't see coming, which was there is this sort of internal debate in these circles over the importance of background knowledge. Like mm -hmm. kids can be, you know, a, an underperforming child, it just being a bad reader doesn't mean you can't read. Uh, it may, it's possible, in fact, more likely than not, it, it may mean you just can't understand what you have just read. And so there's been a lot of talk in development circles about why that is. And there seemed to be a consensus among everyone I talked to. And I talked to people from a, pretty broad spectrum of expertise. And they all said, look, you know, if there's any inherent danger in the core or in interpreting the standards too literally, it's, it's letting students come to material too cold, mm -hmm. not setting it up at least a little bit, even if that's just five minutes of setup before you unpack the Gettysburg Address or whatever it may be. And that was really interesting. Um, and I debated whether or not that's just it's a bridge too far, again, for a lot of people who are listening to me in the shower. Um, but ultimately, I decided that's got to go in there. Um, mm -hmm. And it gave it just enough nuance. And I hope I hope it in those people. Well, maybe I did. Sarah? Um, so I, I've been editing a lot of stories about Common Core, so I'll talk about other people's struggles. <laughs> so um, one of the, the issues that... We assign. We had um, people do a ser uh, series of series, basically last year, where they were following schools, um, and so the reporters came back and were like, "Okay, well, I'm going to do one on the math standards, and one on the English standards, and one on the tests," and like couldn't think of like beyond like just the math and then the English, and there's just so much more to it than just like I'm going to write a story about the math standards. Um, so I think. Um, one of the struggles that we've had to deal with is, is getting people to think about this, not just like, okay, we're going to write about the math standards, but getting deeper into, there's a lot of stuff going on in classrooms that are connected to the, if you're writing about the common core, I think you can compartmentalize, but I think you can also write about other things that are going on in the classroom that are related to these, you know, higher expectations. Um, so for example, Emily actually did a story for us about um, student-centered student learning that did amazingly well on our website. Um, and it was not really about Common Core, but it also was about Common Core. And so I think stepping back a little and thinking about how these things connect to other things that are going on in the classroom is, is important. Um, and not just sort of like, okay, I did my English story and that's it. And then the other thing, um, you know, this is going away a little bit from your question, but but in that vein, I think um, we assigned um, 
Emmanuel, who's here to be our Common Core beat reporter, and I think he probably had the same reaction I did when we first got this money to sort of spend time covering Common Core, like, really great. <laughs> um, and so I think coming up with, so, you know, so he had this assignment to come up with Common Core stories, like, all the time, you know, on a weekly, bi-weekly basis, he's having to come up with story ideas. And I think at first that was really daunting, and now we're just, like, churning them out because there's all these questions that people are, and people are raising these questions today, like, you know, just the question of, you know, how teachers teach. Um, so he had a story on Friday about does Common Core really mean teachers should teach differently? Because actually Common Core really doesn't say anything about that. Um, so sort of asking these questions that are out there and really tackling that as a story. Like people assume this, but is it real? And let's go talk to the guys who wrote Common Core and find out. Um, and that story, you know, did more than 10,000 page views on our website, which for us is really awesome. Um, so I think like just asking those questions that other people are asking um, and and taking those off into a story can get beyond the like, well, I, I you know, I wrote about math and I wrote about English and so I'm done. Um, what do you look for when you go into the classroom with the with the kids, with the teachers, and with experts. You had a really interesting mm. point about experts, Kelly. Really. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I, um, I mentioned that, uh, the piece on the struggle over struggle, uh, but it was important to me that the next story I do, which aired the next day, basically take the research from that story and walk into a classroom and see if, see if it translates. You know, because it's, it's all well and good for, for all of these academics to say, well, this is good and this is bad and this is how it should work. And it's another thing entirely to walk into a fourth or fifth grade classroom and watch a teacher and watch kids for, you know, seven hours and, and not see any of it playing out. Um, so I, I, I did just that. I went into a classroom. And um, I mean, I was, I was looking for a level of engagement across the class. Um, you know, is this is this the standard the standard sort of engagement where you have the five five six seven overachievers who are, you know, who are doing what they would have done five years or ten years ago, or is there, is, I mean, I guess the, I guess the argument that the core folk would say is by, by, by returning the focus to the text itself, you're level you're leveling the playing field, you're reducing the importance of student autobiography. So when I went into this class, which was doing a close reading. I was just watching the kids and seeing how many engaged, how many raised their hands, were they having fun? Um, so I mean, that's that's what I was looking for. It was also part of the story was, are they reading other material that's not complex? So it was it was actually a lot of fun just during free reading time to sit down with kids and say, all right, what's in your desk? Ah, roll doll, a oh, Star Wars. <laughs> you know, really, no, it was it was really fascinating. Again, another misperception about the core is that it pushes all of the fun out, uh, and it just just wasn't true. What about you, Sarah, in the classroom? Um, I, I think it's really helpful to really know, like if you're writing about Common Core and you're going to go observe classrooms, to really know the standards really well, or at least know about the grade that you're going to see and about the curriculum that they're teaching. So you have, I mean, because it's hard for journalists to know, I mean, you can get a good sense of our kids engaged, but it also you can feel a little bit nervous about saying is this good teaching or not and do you really want to say that in your story and so being judging what's going on in the classroom can feel intimidating um, and you worry about like is that really my role um, but I do think it's helpful to sort of have a sense of you know what are the standards supposed to be what should I be talk to experts about like what kind of stuff should I be seeing so that you can have a sense of, about whether that's um, whether that's what's actually happening. So this is not a great example of that, but it's related. Um, we got a submission, an op-ed submission from a teacher in Tennessee from this teacher group that is very involved in Common Core, so I was sort of surprised that they sent it to us from this teacher who said, you know, it's changed, Common Core has changed everything. This year, you know, when we read text, um, the example she gives, when, we read, when we're reading books, you know, I really push my students to connect them to their lives. I was like, that's not really what, com I mean, like, that might be a good thing, but that's not really what Common Core wants you to do. And so, I mean, just knowing, like, I knew enough about Common Core to know that, and, you know, we didn't run the op-ed. Um, but, you know, I think having that knowledge when you go into a classroom, like, is is this what I should be seeing? Um, and thinking about this question of, like, if you go into a math class and they're doing 
the, you know, what is it at now? I, we, whatever, whatever the order yeah. is supposed to, the, the good order that everyone's into right now versus the, um, I, the you, I, we, or whatever it is. Um, so Common Core, again, doesn't really say that you need to be doing it one way or the other. Um, but I think like knowing that about the teaching and they're saying like, look how we're teaching Common Core now, we're doing it in this way where maybe that's not really, like knowing that I think is important context to have so that you're not writing about the Common Core way of teaching. Um, so I just think that having some of that background knowledge is important. So one thing that always trips me up is um, deciding who is an expert. And um, with the Common Core, it seems every second person or every person really is an expert. So how do you evaluate that? Uh, you avoid the experts. Yeah. <laughs> and all the experts like were involved in writing the standards also. So. Yeah. I, I mean, again, one of my rules is to stay in the classroom as much as possible. Um, and. I don't talk to a lot of experts on the core. I'll talk to child development experts, people who say what is or is not developmentally appropriate. I mean, that's interesting to me. Um, but I get really suspicious when someone says I'm a common core expert. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's the teachers. And yeah, I don't ever want to be the grand arbiter of what is or is not good teaching, because I think there are so many different brands of good teaching. Um, but for me, I, I leave the, I leave the experts to to teachers and, and and kids. Frankly, I I feel like as journalists, we all too often get away from the kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they may not be able to tell you what the standards are, but they'll tell you if they're engaged. And at least when it comes to say literacy, any expert who's worth worth their salt will tell you half of the battle is do kids enjoy reading. That matters more than just about anything. Mm -hmm. And so if they're doing things in the classroom that, you know, tamp down that joy then they're doing something wrong. So. Yeah, I agree with Corey very much so on that. I would, the only caveat I would say is it's really interesting to talk to the people who wrote the standards because they are, you know, the experts in the standards and that they wrote them. I'm, I'm biased because I just wrote a story about the guys who wrote the math standards. Um, but they're really, they're really accessible. Um, I would recommend if you're writing about the math standards, you call all three of the guys who wrote them. You can say, I told you to call them um, and blame me. Um, but I, I, they're just, it's really interesting because they're also like not really a fit. Like Jason Zimba is more affiliated and has more um, skin in the game, I think. But, um, but Phil Darrow and, um, and Bill McCullum, like they don't care. Like they'll just tell you what they really think. And, um, and I think it's very use, it's very useful to get their sense. And I think that's where we've gotten a lot of our thinking around, like, what did, the, what did they really mean? Like, what was the intention? Um, and how does that sort of meet with, like, a lot of the questions right now, a lot of the politics? So I actually talk to teachers. And then maybe, like, if you need some of that context about, like, what, it, like, what did the Common Core really mean? Like, or is this a good Common Core math question that people are freaking out about in my district? Um, that they're really, I, the, on the English side, um, Susan Pimentel is one. She's also probably also has more skin in the game, but they're, they're fairly honest. You can't get David Coleman to talk about Common Core anymore. No. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think talking to those guys, I think is, is, is enlightening and interesting. So. Um, one of the, so DC has not been, I mean, it hasn't been kind of controversial in DC public schools. Um, we've had Common Core for four years. Um, but now the big thing are the park assessments. So for the first time, we're going to take the park and everyone is expecting the scores to drop a lot, kind of like the graduation d rates did a few years ago when there's some kind of uniform standard. And so I was wondering whether you all have started kind of doing stories to prepare people for that and what you think a journalist's role is in doing that. Can I go first? No, please. <laughs> um, we so at Heckinger, we have a big plan to start doing some coverage of the test. We've done a lot of writing about the tests. Um, I did a story several I can't remember several years ago about online tests that I don't think even mentioned the Common Core, but was really about Common Core tests. But no one had heard of it, so it seemed there's no point in even putting it in the story. Um, so, but we made it interesting because it was about tests going online and what that meant. Um, so going forward, we want to do um, some 
you know, pretty significant coverage about the lead up to the tests. Um, it's tricky because a lot of it's still up in the air, amazingly still up in the air, given that the tests are, you know, going to be taken in just a few months. Um, but, you know, I think, one, we would love to partner with, we, that's our model, is to partner with um, outlets who are doing some of this stuff. So um, we're always open to talking to people about, you know, what are you doing? Can we help you with any, you know, people power or, you know, just some of the knowledge that we've sort of built up covering this stuff. Um, but I also have sort of a list of ideas that I put down on, on testing. And Emmanuel also has a bunch of ideas in his head that he's working on. So you can go talk to him afterwards. Um, but I think taking the test, I mean, taking the test, I've taken the test. You, if you haven't taken the test and you're going to be writing about the test, you should definitely should take, the, take test. the test. Like it's really interesting. It's super dorky, but it's also, I mean, there's one like where they move the deck chairs. Did you yeah. take that test? Like uh, they move deck chairs. And you're like, is this, I mean, there's cool things, but there's also stuff like that where you're like, I don't know if that's a valuable, you know, thing that you can do. I mean, it's cool because you can do it online. Um, so that's that's very informative. I'm um, sitting in on on you know classrooms where they're prepping for the test. If they're prepping for the test, um, I had a question about all of the part, for example, and I think Smarter Balance had all of these sort of formative assessments you could take throughout the year. And I don't know if anybody's are people using those. I don't know. Um, I'd be really curious if districts are actually using some of these like lead up tests yeah. and then why aren't they to prepare? Um, I'm just sort of curious about that. Um, and then um, I think the performance task piece of these tests is going to be super interesting. So the, the part of the test where kids actually have to do something in their classroom and like, can you sit, are they preparing for that? Can you sit? I don't know if you can even sit in on that. Um, Who's going to grade those? I just think there's a lot of questions that you can get into that would actually be fun to report if you can get access. <clears throat> I wish I could uh, have a couple more hours to answer this because I'm 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 waiting for the next few sessions to tell me what we should be doing uh, <laughs> over the next few months. Testing testing um, confounds me um, in part because of what I said earlier about compartmentalizing. I feel like you know the numbers that Andrew mentioned this morning. You look at how how membership in Park and Smarter Balanced have dropped considerably, and then you look at how many states are Common Core but not using either consortium test. Um, I mean, I know Mike mentioned this a lot this morning, like how common will Common Core be? But that really is the defining question. It's like you reach a point where you have to answer this this sort of existential question about what's the point if you know, a third to half of Common Core states aren't using a common test, then there isn't, there's no more, you know, there's no more cross measurement. There's no more, which was essentially the point, unless you, unless you get back down to, well, we just need higher standards. Um, but it's, it's interesting to me. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I, I will say the, the one other thing that I, I feel sort of obligated to cover, and we've done a little bit of this in the last month, is I feel like as a national audience, um, parents and, and listeners in general just have no sense of how and how often schools test. Um, you know, there's we're in the middle of a really severe testing backlash um, that is, again, it's sort of related to Common Core, but it is not specific to Common Core. We're just at this this interesting moment where. I mean, part of it comes from from No Child, I suppose, um, where superintendents, they don't want to be surprised at the end of the year. And so it's not just one end of the year test. It's a lot of formative assessments that happen every other month or every month. And then there are st there are there are state tests. There are district tests. Um, uh, one of our one of our great writers, Anya Kamenetz, did a story a couple weeks ago that just measured the number of tests kids take in two separate districts. I think one was in Florida. I can't remember where the other one was. Um, and it was mind blowing. You know, the, there are only a couple, you know, big federally mandated tests, well, one or two. Um, and the rest were just lots and lots of little hunt and peck tests 
um, that drive teachers crazy and that parents, because they're not in the classroom, they don't really know what their kids are doing or why they're being asked to do it. You know, a lot of parents conflate all this stuff with the Common Core and say, well, the Common Core has brought in this new era of testing. And, you know, we just have to have to dig into that and unpack it and help explain to people what this testing is really for. And, you know, the scary thing is when you when you go far enough into it, I, I'm not sure anyone knows what some of this testing is for. Mm -hmm. it, it does seem excessive in some districts where they're spending a lot of time testing and there's no there's no benefit to the kids the scores don't even come back until the kids have moved up grades and uh, yeah do we have any questions can you wait till the mic comes around hi um Assessments are another thing that I think is just so interesting and you know like you were saying there are you know so many different tests that these kids take and right now we're in the middle of um, like CCSSO and the Council of the Great City Schools saying that they're embarking on this big national effort to cut down on some of those duplicative tests but what I'm interested in seeing I mean um, I don't get to spend a lot of time in classrooms but with the park exam specifically you know I hear a lot of complaints about how the test prep for that and the testing time is just, you know, through the roof. Like the test can, you know, take nine to 10 hours of testing or something like that. And, you know, is that something that you've seen? Are you seeing like many more hours being spent on that, that specific exam? And I guess what's your experience in classrooms with that? Well, we haven't really start. I mean, we've done a little bit of reporting on that, but I think this is the year where, I mean, it's like sort of this spring where you'll, see some of that in this past fall. Um, I would say I think it's really, like Corey said, it's really interesting to sort of look back and find out what were, what were, what were the tests they were already taking last year throughout the year, like the MAP test and the, other, the district benchmark test that they have to take. Um, and are they taking these park mid-year exams on top of that? I remember a, a, this district I reported on in Delaware for this online testing thing already had like eight tests that they took throughout the year and they were gonna add on these extra ones for Park. Um, I think it was Park. Um, so yeah, I think that's worth asking. I mean, the Smarter Balance I think is supposed to be shorter because it's computer adaptive. That's another interesting little dorky thing about the test is the computer adaptive versus the non-computer adaptive and like what will the test tell you and how sort of gets at the accuracy question. Like what do these tests tell you how much can they tell you about kids, but that doesn't really answer your question well. I think the answer is we'll sort of see this spring. You know, you, the thing that interests me about what you said is, uh, and maybe, maybe we're sort of at the tail end of this, but what we've seen over the last year, year and a half is this really surreal period where you have districts who have largely implemented the core, but we're still giving the old state tests mm -hmm. Um, like I, I did a little thing on on uh, um, on this a couple months ago. There was a huge kerfuffle in Montgomery County, Maryland, because they they had aligned their algebra curriculum to the core, but they realized deep into the semester that they still had to give, or that the state mandated test involved math concepts that were no that weren't part of the core. And so they had, you know, a year of students who had zero familiarity with some key concepts that were going to be on this test. So like all of their algebra teachers, well, all their math teachers, or many of them, um, in the last two weeks of the semester, you know, full stop, move away from the core for two weeks and cram all the extra stuff that's going to be on the state test. And like, I just came back from Oklahoma, um, to do a story on what happens the day after you repeal the core. And it was amazing to me because even though they had adopted the core, like I was talking to teachers who were like third grade, which is a testing grade, uh, and they were giving, you know, the old past tests last year, even though they were working on the core. And some teachers, because they were giving the past tests, were basically not using core at all. And so you get this weird limbo period, and it's not specific to Oklahoma, if it's happening in Montgomery County too, where you've got teachers like straddling multiple standards, yeah. waiting for one test to phase out and another to come in. Um, again, we may, be, we may be at the end of that window, but I, I, 
it wouldn't surprise me if we heard more and more stories. And that just, it's a, it's a heavier burden on us to parse out, okay, but what is this test really? And what is it aligned to? And how many different sets of standards are these teachers or have these teachers been working with in the past year, year and a half? Because again, it's not just Oklahoma where teachers have been straddling standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a story about that in Tennessee that was looking at how, and this is, we didn't really get into this yet, but I think one thing that we talked about beforehand was how to cover the politics, because um, we have to cover the politics. Um, but um, the way we talked about it is is the, the, the way that people, I, I think an important thing to do when you're covering the politics of Common Core is translate what that means for kids and teachers on the ground. Um, so this story in Tennessee was really about all of the crazy politics around Common Core happening in Tennessee, but it was told from the perspective of this district that's been like whole hog Common Core, spent all this money, they're really in it, um, and what do they do now that everything's up in the air? And they've are, their teachers have already been straddling two standards and teaching to the old Texas, or I mean the old Tennessee um, tests, but getting ready for the new ones, um, and their teacher evaluations, you know, in Tennessee are linked to, they use value-added formulas based on these tests, um, and now they don't, still don't know what's going to happen, now they, do, they don't know which test is going to be taught this year at all, because PARC is up in the, I mean, it's just a, it's a disaster for teachers who have to figure out how do we get our kids ready, and it really matters because my job is on the line, um, so I think, you know, there's the question of test prep is also about like, you know, how do you how do you teach it to separate sets of standards, which a lot of people are doing right now. Yeah, I'll just one more thing. The my Oklahoma trip, you know, I'm supposed to be writing a story this week. <laughs> Am I getting a preview? Uh, um, but I went to this one this is fascinating. I went to this one district. Um, that even after repeal, they they finished their implementation, full implementation, like two or three weeks before repeal. So their response was, no, no, we're not doing that. Are you crazy? We're not doing that. Um, and so, so what they're doing is, because the argument that was, was posed to me was, the core standards are more rigorous. So generally speaking, if, if we're asked to revert back to the old PASS standards, which is the Oklahoma standards, um, the core will largely cover us. If we need to realign a few things, um, so be it. Uh, there, they, were, they reviewed the PASS standards to make sure there weren't funky outliers like there were in Montgomery County. If there are a couple of things that the core just dropped that are in PASS, then they, they sort of inserted those in and reworked their curriculum map. But they're essentially sticking with the core. They're going to take the old past test or a new test aligned to the old past standards, um, but they're still largely using the core. So again, it's it, it goes back to what I was saying about nuance. Um, it may be too much nuance, but it's really interesting nuance mm -hmm. and makes for a great story. So, Emily, did you have your hand up? Oh. So I was thinking when we were seeing the um, uh, survey data, that if there were a survey of reporters, where would we come out in terms of our support of Common Core? And I know that's not our role, but it's interesting to think about because you see that teachers were into it, their support has dropped, but the more that they use it, the more that they, the more that they like it. And us as education reporters who get to specialize in it, we're kind of using Common Core a lot too, right? So you'd think, well, we would like it more. So I'm just curious how you keep yourselves critical because I, I don't totally agree that you can compartmentalize these things. I mean, I think the standards and the tests, they're all connected because they're all ultimately gonna be what happens to our education. We're gonna look back and say, did we, did we, did we make it better? Do we improve things? Or do we, you know, is, is all the stuff about the tests and the corporate influence and the money, is all that stuff gonna mess it up and get in the way? So. I'm, how do you keep yourselves critical um, about the Common Core? I, so I answer that this way. Um, I think one of my frustrations as, as somebody who's reporting on it and editing stories is this conflation of the standards and the curriculum because I think so much of the frustration um, and angst about the standards comes from 
bad curriculum. Um, and one of the things talking to the, um, when I was doing this story for Corey and Steve, um, is um, talking to a lot of the, the guys who wrote the standards and just people in that world, um, their point was that it takes a long time to write good curriculum and there's actually nothing out yet that's any good um, with math and it'll probably come out next year. And so sort of hearing that blows your mind a little bit. I think, I mean, we've heard that a lot of teachers are writing their own, which I think is, um, you know, maybe good, maybe bad. Um, but to me, I think that's the, as I've spent a lot of time and more time um, reporting on it, I think it gets frustrating that you, ha you have the major problems with Common Core have to do with not so much the actual standards, but, and this may be the fault, you know, this is something that Phil Darrow said, which is like, or maybe it was one of the guys was like, this may be our fault. Like, we didn't write standards that were easy to write curriculum from. So that's, we're not sort of shifting the blame. Um, but I think I've been, fr I've become more frustrated at just people conflating those two things. Um, so for example, in New York, um, you know, this, the, the state there had, they basically commissioned their own curriculum. They're the only state that did that. A lot of people are using this curriculum around the country because um, it's free. Um, and it seems, you know, good because it was written specifically around the standards. But I think it's kind of, it's not great from <laughs> what I hear. Um, some of it is, but the math curriculum is so-so. Um, Phil Darrow called it homemade and like not in a nice way. Um, so he used a different word, but on the record he said homemade. Um, so I think that's, I mean, I think for me that that's what I've been focused on looking at and being critical about is, okay, the standards are the standards and, you know, there may or may not be research um, around, there is no research around are they good or not? There may be some research that they use to decide what to put in the standards. Um, but I think we've really focused on um, how they're sort of, how they're being translated for classrooms and is that um, good or bad, if that makes sense. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Kind of question. yeah. Because I think there's a lot of frustration from certain people that, that many people in the press have, have sort of told the story. There's the standards and they're good. Yeah. Well, and so this, I'm going to give this one away, but I was writing to a manual earlier, this question of like elementary school, according to these polls, which, you know, some of them, you know, one was funded by Gates and has different, you know, out, outcomes than others. Um, but elementary school teachers seem to love it and high school teachers don't. And I've heard a lot about like the issue, there's some issues with the high school standards. So what's going on there and what is it in those standards? It's problematic. And the writers of the Common Core Math Standards, they will, you know, they have to be very careful, I think, about saying like, well, we really fucked up geometry or whatever. But I think, but I do think that there's, um, I think that if you talk to people, you can sort of get at like, what are the issues? Because it's also hard as a reporter to know, like, what should kids in third grade learn? You know, um, but Although it's also not, it's 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 also not that it's not that controversial. I mean, like yeah. one of the one of the big questions in Oklahoma, since legislators there have right of approval over new standards, and they've made perfectly clear that they don't want another Indiana, they don't want the new standards to look like the core. One big question is, well, you know, a lot of these standards are standard and should be. Um, but sorry, I interrupted you. No, I should stop. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest, Emily. I I use a sort of. It's going to sound cheesy, but I'll say it anyway. I use a sort of soulful internal barometer for how I personally think about the core and whether or whether I'm being too critical or not critical enough. And that is, um, you know, I have spent time in classrooms with teachers. California, Michigan, West Virginia, Oklahoma, Maryland, um, all over the place. And, and I ask as many teachers as I possibly can, and I try to have long conversations with as many teachers as I possibly can about these things, both with my mic on and with my mic off. And, you know, the funny thing is, I just, uh, perfect example, I went to Oklahoma and I booked ahead a number of interviews. 
Um, but I also went to a Christmas tree lighting in Oklahoma City with the governor that just happened to be a big ed event. So there were students and teachers from all over the state. And this is Oklahoma. Uh, and I walked around and I just, I went up to every adult I could and I said, are you a teacher? Got a question for you. Are you a teacher? And the funny thing is the, the, the first thing they said when I said Common Core, they said blah, blah, blah. So I just turned off my mic. I didn't get a lot of sound from this event, <laughs> sadly. I, I got a lot of sound of teachers saying, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really have anything to say. And then I turned off the mic and just about every one of them said um, one of two things. One, I like the standards. I'm just tired of the controversy. Or two, I like the old past standards because they were much more specific. They gave me less latitude and more direction. And frankly, at this point, I just want to know what people want me to do so I can do it. I just, yeah, I think that that, I think I have, I mean, I think we're also influenced by talking to lots of teachers and how they feel about it. And most teachers we've talked to, and I've said this before, and I was like, most of the teachers that we've talked to um, like the standards. And so that influences how you feel about them. Like if teachers like it, well, it's probably not so bad. Um, but I think it was really interesting. One of our reporters did a story um, and she's a mom and she got some bad Common Core math homework, you know, sent home and was like wrestling with like bad Common Core math. And she's, you know, been covering sort of a lot of the teacher evaluation um, kerfuffle that's going on. So she had definitely, you know, negative perceptions about the Common Core. And then she did this story around the school that had really not done what anyone else was doing around Common Core, but really done some interesting stuff and was pulling ahead. And she came away from it thinking like, oh, it's not as, you know, I, I was kind of, you know, sort of biased against it. And now I don't feel the same way. She's still like, confused by the math homework. But I think um, it was interesting that she had that experience like in a school talking to teachers who were, who were doing, they weren't using the pieces of the curriculum that weren't any good. And they, um, and, and so I think she came away with it feeling, you know, maybe not pro common core, but I think feeling differently. So I, I really like what you said about talking to teachers. And the, one, I'll say one more thing, which is, you know, I, I, I am, I am always wary of people who criticize the core um, who haven't read the standards um, and haven't been in a classroom in 20 or 30 years. And you get a lot of folk out there. That is not to discount criticism of the core because I think there are lots of valid arguments against the core. But one of the things I try to do in deciding what stories to tell and how to tell them is I want to make sure that when I'm being critical of the core that, that there are arguments that I can actually explore you know, that it's not, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to do any more stories about federal overreach. Um, you know, I just, I just feel like that's, that's, that's played out. And again, that's one of those, those circular arguments. Um, so, you know, I just, for me, it's important when I do have criticism in my stories, um, or when I'm thinking critically about, about the core and, and what arguments to explore, like to talk to people who, who, who know a thing about a thing. Um, again, when it came to literacy and struggle, you know, talking to development experts were like, yeah, you know, I mean, again, another one of these things that came up, it was, it was great. And it actually came out in my, my first parent teacher conference with my son's kindergarten teacher. I'd done this story. We we're talking about text complexity, text complexity. And people started saying it is a good thing, but not for early decoders, not in kindergarten, not in first grade, second grade. It's, it's not clear. Um, and uh, and I, I mentioned I mentioned that to my son's kindergarten teacher, and she's like, "Oh, yeah, I wish I wish that message could be heard higher up." Um, so I think she actually forwarded my story to her superintendent. Probably shouldn't have just said that on the record. Nobody <laughs> tell anybody I said that. Um, but anyway, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. I have sort of a macro question, and then like a more personal micro question for you guys. Uh, I guess the macro would be how has or has the Common Core changed or altered education coverage generally? Have you seen education coverage get better as a result? And then personally, 
has the Common Core altered how you cover education? Has it changed your methodology? Have you been forced to prioritize certain types of stories over others? Could you speak about that? You go first. Um, I mean, I think the common, I think education coverage was getting a little more sexy already. I mean, you had new outlets opening up education verticals um, in a way that didn't exist when the Heckinger Report formed because we formed because there wasn't enough education coverage out there. And now there's a lot of education coverage out there, um, which is a good thing. And I think, and you know, I think as I had said earlier, you know, Common Core coverage does shockingly well. Like, and it's really amazing that we have 150,000 page views for this Common Core story we ran last year on our little bitty Heckinger website. Um, so I think, yes, I think it's made people care a little bit more about education for better or for worse. Um, and then what was the second, what was the personal question? Oh, how we, um, I don't know if it has. I think it's, I think we're at a, this may, this is going to sound hyperbolic. I think we're at a kind of a dangerous phase in covering the core. Um, Cause boy, when I go, when I walk over to morning edition or all things considered and I say, Hey, I'm working on another core piece. They look <laughs> at me like, Oh, come on, Turner. Really? <laughs> another one? Um, because I feel like for so long, the politics of the core has created this, the cycle of really similar monotonous mm -hmm. stories that we all get yeah. tired of. And, and that's that, you know, if I were on either side of that argument, I'd be tired of it. Um, and so, you know, I, it's forced me to up my game, you know, to get into the standards and get into classrooms and explain them and talk about them in a meaningful, substantive way that's also compelling. So that when I do walk over to one of these shows, all I have to do is play the first minute of my story and say, see, it's better than that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I feel like that's our obligation at this point because there are easy stories to tell about the core. Um, but quite often, those are the stories that we probably shouldn't be telling anymore. You know, it's time to do something else. Like the core has been around for four years. We got to stop telling the same stories. Um, what are some of the stories both of you don't see and you would like to see more of? I think people earlier today and the other panels talked about teacher training and professional development, and it's so hard to write about. I mean, it's really hard to make professional development interest, just the word. I mean, we sort of have a ban on the term at all in our cut story. So, like, how do you write about it? It's something you can't even say, you know, it's like Voldemort, you know, like you can't say professional development. So, but I think it's really important. We actually, we did a story for the Boston Globe magazine about professional development that did really, really well, um, where we sent a reporter to a solution tree. I'd always wanted to send someone to a solution tree um, workshop, which is one of those like big cold rooms with a like lecturer standing up in front and people paid like $400 to be there. Um, and so, you know, I think it was a way into a really important topic um, that's really hard to tell um, and it's really hard to write about. But I think finding ways to talk about how teachers are being trained is really important. Um, it's, it's just tricky, um, but I think it should be done. Yeah, I think I'm, yeah, professional development. I mean, I did this idea. I did a story on professional development last year. It's one of those things like, I still, I still think about one of the pieces of tape that plays in my mind the most came from a teacher in Baltimore when I did this teacher development last year. And I asked her, it was at lunchtime and I didn't have my microphone on because she wouldn't talk to me otherwise. And she said, you know, I'm not opposed to the standards, but I'm just really afraid that this is going to be another one of those things that becomes a thing that I'm told not to do anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, prof professional development is is meaningful. I'm trying to think if there are other things. Now, I just want to hear more ambitious stories. I want to. I want to hear people really digging into the guts of these things, and and just surprising me. Um, every once in a while, I'll stumble across a story that I just really love. I mean, it's the Sarah's story that we we haven't used yet, but it's great. It's a Jason Zimba, <laughs> one of the math writers. It starts with a scene of him. Um, uh, drilling his kids on math concepts on Saturday morning because he's not happy with <laughs> core implementation in their school district. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's really That's pretty awesome. great. And it's, I mean, what's interesting about it is that they're just doing eight plus five equals like 17 plus two equals. I mean, it's really like basic math is just, he's just drill, he's just drill and killing his daughter. And you're like, this is common core. <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, I'm curious whether um, you've looked into it all how um, remedial education may be changing because of Common Core, because one thing teachers talk a lot about is how, and it was designed, the people who wrote it talk about it too, how it was designed one year to build off the next. So what happens if kids finish the year and they have fallen behind? And I'm just curious, I, I've been looking for a, a way to get at that and wondered if you've done any stories about it. Just to clarify, do you mean like remediation once they graduate? Like Arnie Duncan is always talking about, you know, remediation the first year of college, or you're just talking about um, making kids do work at grade level, and then who's being honest about whether or not they're actually at grade level and what to do about it? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. Um, that played into my literacy series a little bit um, because the core and the core tests will have kids tested at grade level. And for a lot of these kids, it's the first time they're taking tests where the material is actually at grade level, which is kind of shocking. I didn't, I didn't realize that until I was doing the story. And like, so like grade, so if you're in fourth grade, you'll be tested on, on you'll be given passages from a fourth grade reading level text, um, which believe it or not, wasn't always the case. Mm -hmm. um, but you raise a good question, which is, well, just because you expect kids to do that doesn't magically, you know, we're not unicorn territory. It doesn't mean they're going to be able to do it. Um, then the question is, well, what do you do about it the next year or the next year? If you're constantly keeping kids mm -hmm. or expecting kids to work at grade level, unless you have all kinds of new scaffolding that's going to get them there. You know, it's like, I think it was Carmel who was saying this morning, it's important to raise expectations. It is. Um, but you know, expectations are clouds. You know, you, you've got to you've got to get them there. Um, so I think that's a great story. Yeah. You know what what are districts doing? I mean, it's also early to it's also early to know because until we have tests that are aligned to the core, it's really hard to know if the core is working or if you know if mm -hmm. kids are reading if more kids are reading at grade level or if more kids are doing math at grade level. It's and hard what? to know. Okay, sorry. I was just going to say when we did a story on on special education, which is somewhat related to that, but how can special ed kids meet these new expectations and take these tests and so on, and what's being done? And so I think it was interesting because, and we've and I've talked to you know English language learner teachers. So getting into those classrooms, like what are you doing with the kids who um, are going to have a harder time keeping up? Um, and um, and talking to teachers about their strategies and their frustrations. Um, you know, in New York, for example, they had lesson plans that that were supposed to be for 45 minutes, and teachers were like, "We, I need double that, triple that time to actually get these kids meeting that standard or meet, you know, really getting to the end of the lesson." So well, we are exactly at time, so we're going to wrap up. Thank you very much, Sarah and Cody. Good. Thank I'd you. I'd like to give everybody a hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. I thought that was.